Hello, everyone. So welcome to our webinar. Uh, sorry for a bit of delay. We had some technical issues. Um, I would like to give the floor to Seamus Hoyn to welcome all of you and give of a, a, a brief presentation of uh, today's webinar. Great, thanks very much, Diana, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules to, to join us today. So um, the, the purpose of today is really to give you a, a taste and an insight into the activities that have been ongoing under the Remarkable Climate Leaders Project. Um, and the, the project is funded through the European Union's Horizon Programme and uh, emerged out of uh, discussions focusing on particularly our 2050 ambitions to be climate neutral and how we could achieve that and how we could enable people yeah. across Europe to build uh, their leadership skills to address climate neutrality. Um, so it's uh, been a unique kind of focus, not just on the technical aspects of climate neutrality, but very much looking on how we can build leadership, identify leaders that exist across local authorities, municipalities and across Europe. And I suppose today we will get a taste of the work we've done in terms of understanding leadership and understanding the kind of the ethnographic approaches that we've taken, which has been a real learning experience for the partnership in terms of understanding uh, the behaviours and the, the aspects of leadership across the, uh, the municipalities and local authorities in Europe. Um, and then we will speak uh, to, we will have speakers from a number of uh, regions that have participated in the project from Slovenia and Croatia. And then we'll have an interactive session with uh, people from across the consortium, right from Austria, right through to, to Sweden, looking at what has happened in those regions in terms of climate leadership. Um, but I suppose to, to set the scene, I think it, it is fair to say, and I suppose this, this is often mentioned at a, a number of different uh, fora, that Europe really has taken the lead in um, climate, the climate neutrality agenda and uh, the climate change agenda, uh, setting very ambitious policy goals and backing that up with a legislative agenda. And so it's, it's very important for regions, uh, local authorities, local energy agencies and municipalities, I suppose, to understand that the, the policy agenda is a very strong has has never been as strong and with with more uh, legislative activity still to happen in this uh, period of um, the, the Commission and the Parliament. So to make up for a little bit of time due to and I was the technical problem in terms of connecting. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Ty Breen, who's deputy head of unit at DG Enner uh, to give some insights from uh, DG Enner in terms of the um, <laughs> perspectives that we have uh, in terms of leadership in Europe uh, coming from DG Enner's perspective. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to Taig. Thanks very much. Thanks, Seamus. Um, so first of all, just to check that I am visible and audible. Yes. Yes. OK, super. I was just concerned for a second as you've actually I just realized somebody has to actually say yes. If everybody thinks somebody else will do it, we need it's another example of where you need leadership in the response. Um, so uh, I just want to say a few words about why I think this initiative is so important and so relevant and uh, maybe and in particular why I think it's so important, and so relevant at this particular juncture in the political cycle and how we, we can draw things together. So, um, of course, we are now coming towards the end of one commission. We're approaching um, Parliament elections to the European Parliament. We will have a new commission nominated uh, later this year. And so we are in the process of setting the, the political agenda uh, from our technical perspective, but also I think all the all, all across the across the political perspective uh, across Europe in terms of looking at what we want. I think another point that's very clear at the moment is there's but a deep concern about what's sometimes called a backlash, but I is a phrase sometimes I don't particularly like personally, uh, but as or a sense of fatigue with the climate challenge and the steps we're taking to it in the European Green Deal. Um, 
and uh, a sense that this needs to have a, a more a, and a sense of the political momentum behind it might not be what it was five years ago. Um, so I think the idea of having leadership and how we can engage on the ground then becomes particularly important. Now, I'm the deputy head of unit in a unit that's called uh, that's called Just Transition Consumers, excuse me, Consumers, Local Initiatives and Just Transition. And we see them as being very much tied together. I want to emphasize emphasize this last part of it, the Just Transition. Um, so the first point is that we have to look at what a transition is. Um, and here, we, in one sense, it's sometimes called a climate transition, but I think of it more as about, in many respects, it's actually not completely, but in many respects, it's actually an energy transition. It's a change in how everybody across the world, but particularly in Europe, will um, will need to change the way they produce, consume, use, manage their energy needs. And this is going to have profound impacts on the everyday life of every citizen. And we do this in a situation where many citizens feel that they had no choice or weren't involved in creating the problem. And so if you read some of the research about something like the Rio Vest, you will see that this was not built on climate skepticism per se. It was built on a perception of unfairness about the way the transition was being uh, managed and the impact it was having on people's lives. Which brings me to the second point about the just transition is, you know, what's just is really, you could look it up and say it's about what's fair, or perceived to be fair, both in process and in outcomes. Um, I think we can really think our way through. So in one sense, this is a highly political uh, concept of fairness and justice, something that's, that's managed in the political sphere. But another one, it's actually a very personal one, you know, very, very detailed one. And what we can say is that the more we look at it, we will see that if people don't perceive the process of being fair, they will withdraw their support. Or if they perceive that the changes that are happening are benefiting, even if it's not having a negative effect on them, are benefiting others in particular, somehow a sense of elites are being done to the benefits of others, they will withdraw their support. Um, also, if people feel that they can't afford this or is putting too much of a challenge on their pocketbook, it will be perceived as being unjust. But what we see even more is that to change these perceptions, you, you it's not about having a top down approach. It's not about um, just saying that, you know, we in Brussels as we're often declared to mean have decided this is what it must be done. It's rather the contrary. It's about having a sense of bottom up and ownership of the transition that's actually happening. Now, we can say that we really, we really actually have engaged in our unit, in our DG, in this, and trying to change this shift and make the energy transition and therefore the climate transition be something that is built also from the bottom up, building on the ideas that were in President von der Leyen's political agreement of leaving no region. Or no citizen behind. But in terms of what that means and the hows, every time we look at it, we find that, that is about giving somebody a sense of ownership and participation in the changes that are happening so that they don't feel that they are changes that are happening to them, but changes that they are engaged with. I want to give you a couple of examples of very of, of things here and I, why I think this is this climate leadership incident is so important. But I want to give you some other examples that we have been directly involved in managing and working with local regions and individual citizens in delivering this. So one example is the Coal Regions in Transition Initiative, where we work with local regions for them to develop transition plans to manage the impact of closing down coal mines and related energies in their regions, what that will happen, what that will do and what that will mean for it. So that those regions and those regions directly and the people directly concerned are empowered and motivated to to manage this transition themselves and not to see it as something where the system has cast so many people out of work but rather that they say these changes outside are happening and we can be part of it and we can manage that and we can own it and we can develop our plan to do it and this work actually this work actually preceded the implementation of the just transition fund and was key to the development of the plans that underlie the just transition mechanism that was developed under this commission. 
Another really important example that we have is working with islands. And it, islands are, um, I could go through all the numbers about how many people live on islands and how many there's X thousand islands. We don't actually know quite how many islands there are in the EU because they range from quite big, I mean, I don't know if we can count Ireland in this particular example, but range from quite big Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, but really down to much more small islands across the Union. They're in every part of the uh, Union, by which I mean in the north and the south, maybe not so much in the east, north, south and west. Um, what they actually have is a unique set of challenges in managing the transition because they have these islands have have depended on essentially a uh, support regime to to equalize the costs from uh, of energy of electricity in particular but yet they sit and have some of the most uh, abundant renewable resources and so we have worked with islands across europe and most recently through uh, supporting 30 new renewable islands by 2032 become 100 percent renewable by 2030 working with the local communities to develop their transition plans so that they develop a plan that identifies, utilizes the necessary resources, but also, and this is absolutely critical, helps them to engage with the political level in the member state, which is often responsible for the support for the island's energy needs, and with the network operators, so that we can change this from being something, again, I said, that happens to the local island, happens to the island and is just given by the capital, but it's something that is a managed and owned transition by those islands. We've worked very closely with um, with, with uh, local authorities through the Covenant of Mayors to really help these local authorities develop transition plans and to develop them and to identify ways in particular of addressing energy poverty. And energy poverty is something that affects many citizens across across the union. I think it's we get numbers depending on how you do it of almost approaching 10% following the energy crisis. Of people reporting that they're not able to manage their to, to heat their home. Now, again, I come back to the point is how could you engage with somebody to to engage with the energy transition when they struggle to heat their home? And then you have this sense of this is something that's happening to me. Now I could go on and on and on about examples of individual things we do, but what do they all have in common? I think is where we come to this this climate leadership concept. Is like, you know, we all know, or at least I learned, is that it takes a particular type of person to put in place all these activities and I, I like to joke that and certainly as my direct experience is that the people I've engaged with from the islands from Ireland are the same people who I know I would have met if I were involved in local sports because they would have been running the sports team they're the same people who if I were church going I would be they'd be running the church raffle or if I were a uh, teacher would be heading teachers unions, or if I were uh, politically active, would be active in one of the political parties. It's my experience. It's like the, the to, to, and what we need to do is to tap into these resources that exist on islands in communities as much as the amount of sun that is there. These resources of understanding and organization and drive and commitment and connection and harness them to helping to deliver the energy transition. Now that might be through helping set up an energy community. An energy community is a way for people to directly invest and consume energy collectively locally. Uh, it might be in taking, and here I move on to more climate things, of taking more measures to enhance uh, local mobility, improve the access to sustainable forms of transport. But this, and this is I go to this kind of leadership skill and this kind of Ability to do it is is key if we are talking about empowering communities and empowering people to address the climate challenge and address and manage the energy transition so that it is perceived as being just, so that it is perceived as being fair, both in its process and its outcomes, and not something that's cooked up by, dare I say, it, people like me in Brussels, although you know in another world I'm engaged in my community, but that it's not just engaged by people like me. And and I think this requires concerted actions. This is why I was so interested in who participated in, the, in, in today's event. This really requires identifying and working with people both to see what works and how can we motivate people, but also to help people who want to engage in this, in this energy transition, who want to ensure it's a just transition. And if they do that because they're engaged in their communities, because 
they will be able to bring, I think the phrase that is often used here is to be multipliers. If we can talk about this climate leadership or this energy leadership, I think then we can start thinking about the backlash that we fear in a slightly different way. And I go back to the to the Yellow Vest movement, or the Gilets Jaunes movement, because what I thought was, in some respects, it was very interesting if you looked at the, if those organizational capacities had been, if we could have motivated them and used them to deliver a climate leadership, because I think there was, there was a lot of, um, like I said, these, the, the movement and many people in this movement are not climate deniers. They are not rejectionists. They're, that that strain, of course, exists. But many people are want to, they, what they really want to ensure, to ensure is an empowered, fair way that they perceive as being fair and just and brings them along. So. I started off by saying we're in a very interesting political context where we go by. And, and in my view, and this is my, me speaking personally, there's two big issues coming forward and they sometimes are seen as being in, in conflict with each other. And one is how do we ensure competitiveness of the European Union going forward and this big discussion about the link between energy and competitiveness. And the other one is this idea of the just, just transition. Sometimes these can be seen as being somehow not linked to each other, or one is hard nosed and economic, and the other one is, how do you say, soft and talking about people. I, I actually reject that 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 approach. I think we can see it as being a different way. What we say is having when we put competitiveness at the front, we put the just transition at the front of what it is we're trying to achieve, is that we put the users of the system first. We put the people who are consuming energy first, whether that is industry or whether that is a, a, a household. We put them at the center of what it is that we're trying to achieve. And that we don't inadvertently give the messages that you must deliver demand response for the sake of the system. Sometimes, and I understand this from an engineering perspective, sometimes if you listen to us speak, you can have the impression that the role of the consumer is to support the electricity system or to support the energy system. Whereas I think actually the other way around, the role of the energy system is to deliver sustainable energy to consumers. And the consumer is part of that and has to be seen as being the part in the part that delivers. So I'm sorry if I've withered on a little bit too much, but I want to start out, want to finish up by, by just saying um, how important I think it is that we that we pick up on all the work that you're doing here and that we find ways to, well, dare I say, to multiply the work that you're doing as you find ways to multiply the engagement of individual uh, people and climate leaders. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing uh, more input during the course of the day. Although I may have to run reasonably quickly because I've been called by uh, people who I uh, serve rather than who serve me. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for that. Those insights and uh, thought provoking comments. I think uh, a couple of I suppose critical points for me was absolutely in terms of that that just transition. Um, but I think your, your closing points in terms of putting the people at the center um, is critical. We we as engineers often uh, focus on the tech and the technology and lose sight of and the process and the system rather than thinking about uh, outcome driven uh, components. And I suppose the other point that struck me and I think we, we will we will see evidence of that over the, the next hour is that there are many, many leaders across our communities and our regions and the municipalities that have been doing great work, but maybe have been hidden because they are just doing it. Um, and we we have managed to uh, find a lot of those 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 nuggets and those uh, those special people who I think by this engagement through the remarkable project has actually given them a, an additional sense of pride and will hopefully drive them further in terms of their leadership uh, ambitions and through the support that they've got through the, the partners in the project. Uh, so thanks very much for your insight, Tyg, and for taking your time out. I know it's a it's a busy time uh, at the moment. Uh, and I want to say, and I'll stay as long as I can, but just uh, if I will, and I will say in the chat when I have to leave. Great, thank okay, thanks very much. Um, so the, the the starting point of the, the remarkable project was uh, getting to try and educate ourselves around leadership and this foreign topic to us engineers around ethnography and understanding people. Um, this was quite a unique part of the remarkable project and the consortium. 
uh, which is made up mainly of, of uh, local and regional energy agencies and uh, their staff who, as I mentioned, are primarily involved in the technical world, but dealing with people all of the time. Um, so we were very lucky to have researchers and experts from the University of Ljubljana. So I'm delighted to invite uh, Doman Bantrik, who's going to speak around the topic of ethnography and how we we applied it within the project. So Doman, uh, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seamus. Uh, can you hear me just to yes. check? Yeah. OK, I'll, I'll try to share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Let's uh, present. All right, well, um, thank you for this uh, lovely opportunity to, to spread the word about ethnography and specifically on the case of a Remarkable Project. I put here ethnography and climate leadership, the case of a Remarkable Project, because I think, you know, this, uh, what, we've di what we've done in Remarkable can, of course, uh, be replicated and is replicated uh, beyond beyond the project, but it's a, it's an interesting case. And I think this introduction now was um, was perfect because uh, we've 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 heard what I've been trying to communicate within Remarkable also to my partners that uh, we should always start with the people. People are at the center of whatever uh, we try to to achieve. Yeah, so we live in houses. Uh, it's not that houses live around us, right? So uh, it is we who use energy. It is uh, we who try to make a change as leaders. So I'll try to present a bit of a, a short case of ethnography. I don't have a lot of time, so maybe um, uh, you know it's going to be more like a taste, uh, but uh, end up on on certain um, key points. Uh, uh, those of you who are present, I'm sure you know a lot about Remarkable already. It's about empowering current local leaders to become climate leaders. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time here. Time here. Um, a lot of activities have been going on. So climate leadership program, uh, climate neutrality roadmaps uh, we've created. Um, and we, of course, we're developing different types of services. And uh, throughout the, uh, our project, we also, of course, uh, applied on ethnography. Yeah. So. It, what is ethnography um, to, for those of you who might not be familiar with the term? Um, so I tend to explain that ethnography is sort of like a set of qualitative research methodologies. Uh, methodologies. So one is participant observation. Uh, you know, if I make it simple, is researchers going into the areas or communities they want to uh, engage with and research and be present in uh, the moment, be present through a prolonged period of time. So uh, be a participant, observe uh, and consciously do this uh, exercise consciously. So this is participant observation. Then interviews, I'm sure you're more, th more familiar with. Uh, there are different types of interviews. There is also focus groups and other types of methodologies that ethnographers use. Mm, all these methodologies enable researchers such as anthropologists. This is the, mo the most, let's say, Mm, uh, discipline most associated with, with ethnography. Um, so these researchers using ethnography um, use it to gather, cluster, reflect, uh, and interpret qualitative data that they collect uh, through their research. Um, what's, what characterizes ethnography is flexibility sometimes, or most of the times it should also be spontaneity. So it's not all structured and uh, goal oriented necessarily. So it gives you a wider scope of, um, of research focus to define uh, things that you might have not even expect to uh, encounter or, or uh, define. And uh, well, typically it lasts for long periods of times, so let's say for months or even years. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But um, uh, what I want to really emphasize today in this presentation are the principles of ethnographic research. So here are the, they're listed here, and these are also the principles we try to apply within Remarkable. So to search for connections, search for connection, connections between people, between leaders and their communities, between material uh, uh, culture within their communities. So uh, objects, uh, you can think of, I don't know, uh, different infrastructures, if we're thinking about, let's say, energy transition and so on. So to search uh, connections between uh, communities, between people, between their environments, 
uh, and uh, individuals. So these are the connections that we are trying to um, uh, define and understand. Uh, also to draw experience based conclusions, which means which relates to us going to the field to really try to ex experience the reality of everyday life through our own experience to build on existing knowledge. This is from our peers, for example, um, and of course science uh, to emphasize empathize uh, with our, um, uh, let's say, communities and individuals around us. Um, to build relationships and to observe ethical principles. These are principles of ethnographic research, and we tried to also practice them within Remarkable. Um, so coming back to the long period of research that I, I noticed, uh, I, I noted. Um, so as I said, anthropologists uh, are the ones who uh, are associated associated most closely with ethnography. But anthropologists, this is like to say, you know, you're a doctor. Uh, but there's different ways of how you can heal people, different methods uh, we, you can use. So anthropologists uh, are only, let's say, one specific discipline that used it. And of course, uh, this used to look like uh, going to some distant islands and do research uh, with of those communities. And in a lot of people's heads, uh, this is what they think about when they hear about ethnography or anthropology. But in reality, you can do this kind of, uh, you can apply these principles of research in uh, different environments and of course, uh, also different contexts. Nowadays, we don't necessarily have so much time to, to take a year uh, to go somewhere and study a group of people, but we can do uh, different times, uh, smaller scale researches uh, as we did in, in Remarkable in different environments and different tribes, you could say modern tribes, uh, uh, I would call them. Uh, here you have a couple of examples, you know, that uh, let's say in business oriented world or in the construction site or when you go to a football game, all of those are examples of some sort of communities that uh, we can engage with uh, with, uh, with the help of ethnographic principles. Um, so within Remarkable, I won't go very much into detail of what we did. I just put here, let's say, a timeline from the beginning of the project, just to give you an idea that it's not just um, unstructured uh, uh, going out to, to the field and getting lost in the crowd and trying to uh, think big thoughts. Uh, there is, of course, method behind it. There are interviews. There is uh, a time plan. Uh, here, if you read some of these uh, uh, of these small clouds, you'll see that uh, there were uh, a lot of important steps that we had to do uh, to start Remarkable with ethnography. Uh, but the point is, coming back to what, what I said before, the point is to, to apply the ethnographic principle within Remarkable. So this enabled us within the project to get insights into our leaders and their community's worldview, which was very important for us to start, to kickstart our work, to start thinking about how to develop our climate uh, leadership program, to think about how most efficiently start developing the roadmaps and so on. So this was really the base uh, to start, you know, meaningfully developing uh, our project. Um, the other point was to empathize, empathize better or more with our uh, leaders and their communities, um, to feel closer to them, to maybe even feel part of, of their communities. Um, and then, of course, also to question our own biases and impl implicit assumptions, because every time we go into a new project, we go with our baseline knowledge, and that, of course, influences of how we think. But there's always something new to learn about and to think about when we get out into the field and um, engage. And also it's to define the, this is uh, the unknown knowns and unknown unknowns, things we know that we don't know, but there's also things we don't know we don't know. And this is how, uh, this is where ethnography uh, also helps us uh, to do better work. And for, for to, to finish off, uh, it didn't only um, inform the development of the project at the beginning. Actually, we try to uh, sort of intertwine our ethnographic principles also uh, into our, uh, let's say, um, outcomes and into our climate leadership program to pass them on also to our leaders. So here I tried to do a bit of a, a connection and uh, I'll now assume that everyone who are listening to me now are, are leaders. So this is an, an appeal to you. So uh, an appeal to search for connections that you strive to understand the complexities of everyday realities within your communities, within the communities you lead through their locally specific networks of meanings. 
uh, also to draw ex your uh, so conclusions based on experience. So uh, uh, go out and have firsthand experience uh, within your communities before you make uh, very important conclusions. Uh, don't be stuck in your office and in the, into books. Go out there and uh, engage with people. Build on the existing knowledge, uh, build, base your conclusions and actions on the knowledge and insights shared by relevant peers and experts around you. Um, don't forget to empathize, so acknowledge the other's worldview, even though you don't necessarily agree with, but it's important to acknowledge it and to understand how that can help you um, uh, better understand the world and do what you want to do better. Um, also build relationships. This is very important as leaders. Bu build solid relationships with the people around you, especially those that help you be a better leader and achieve your shared goals. Shared is important because it's not only your own, but it's of the people around you. And of course, observe ethical pr principles throughout because strong personal integrity is the foundation of strong leadership. Um, I'll finish here. Um, this is something I wanted to communicate in terms of how uh, ethnography was part of Remarkable, and I hope you will also take something of that back home. And um, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll give it back to Seamus now. Thank you very much, Domin, and for that uh, insights and an overview of the ethnographic activities. And I think it's fair to say that uh, it was a a, a very positive challenge for us all to engage in this space and to to understand. I think some of the, the critical points for me, uh, I love that word, modern tribes. Um, I think I might weave that into my uh, discussions later on. I think it's a, a really nice image of climate tribes. Um, I think the, the piece about understanding your our biases and our assumptions is was for me really part of the pro important part of the process that we might assume that climate leadership in a region is x uh, or y but actually the people in that community uh, often understand better uh, because of their connections with that community in that region and that piece about building relationship and that shared goal is 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 critical so thanks very much Domin and I hope we will continue this engagement both through the, the, the project and FEDERN and other local and regional energy agencies into this ethnographic space. Um, OK, so I suppose the, the next piece now is to look at local examples of what's happened. So uh, we're going to go to both uh, Slovenia and Croatia. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Vlasta from uh, from Slovenia, she's the director of the Regional Energy Agency, Regional and Climate Agency, I think, which is very important to yes. mention. Many energy agencies now are speaking about energy and climate together in, in the same sentence. But also Vlasta brings a unique perspective in that she is also uh, a mayor. Um, so she brings uh, an interesting insight and perspective uh, often having to tread both sides of the, the track in her work. So Vlasta, I'm going to pass over to you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and giving me the possibility to present a little bit of uh, good practices or what we have done within the Remarkable. So I will um, tell you shortly. So the first is uh, a little bit of the historical background of Slovenia. So uh, in Slovenia, the people, they don't want to be the first one, front runners. So this was, you know, encouraging or working a lot on this, that people uh, put themselves or uh, they do a lot, but still to put themselves as a, as a leader was a big uh, challenge. And uh, so this, I think the um, Energy and Climate Agency uh, work a lot in this field, how to really involve these people, because many cases around the region are showing that people are leaders somehow, just they have the perspective a little bit different. So, and um, I think the, the the good case that we could um, present and tell that is really a good case is our service for one-stop shop. So, especially the climate uh, adaptation issues that are coming really um, in front, uh, they're coming ahead of the this time. Especially Apologies, as you know, Lasta, yeah. sorry for interrupting you. Um, we're not seeing you at the moment. You're camera is black so i'm just wondering 
I don't know why. Oh. Is it better now? No, we're just getting a, a blank screen for some reason. Oh, I'm very sorry. I have a switched on camera, but I don't know. We so can hear, I will just, we, we my can colleague hear is coming. Oh, there you yep. go, you're there Oh, now. thank you, thank you very much. So just good colleague in, it's, uh, yeah. So uh, because we have seen that, uh, especially in um, in this field of adaptation and uh, part also in the mitigation, the municipalities, there are really lack of the knowledge, lack of the information and lack of the ideas how really to implement the project and within this we within this um, one-stop shop service that our agency has been uh, developed we are offering to the municipalities to their staff to politicians and also to any um, uh, professional institutions that are working in in that field we are helping them with the procedures with the understanding so i think this a whole package of the service that uh, that we as agency are able to deliver is very very helpful because uh, as you know adaptation is not only about understanding a little bit on the energy side but it's also understanding the interactions between different sectors between different topics and also for example different um standard and firstly, we have done a lot on the regional level, so the, the whole region uh, joined the EU adaptation mission. And within this, we are has prepared and still we are in phase of preparing, you know, very good vulnerability study and try to understand where our region is the most vulnerable and then to have uh, these action plans and uh, specific activities for each um, municipality. So, uh, yeah, we built uh, all this time a lot of this capacity inside the energy agency, energy and climate agency that we are able then to um, to deliver this. I think maybe this is for a uh, for a start, and then yeah, if there are any question, I will be happy to answer. Great, thanks very much, Vlasta. And I think uh, that piece about understanding culture is very critical. I think, uh, as you mentioned, in terms of the the culture in Slovenia, is is has a particular history and component that we need to understand. Um, and then I think that that piece around understanding the complexity of what we're, what climate neutrality is and climate adaptation is that people need support to try and navigate that complex environment. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Milenko uh, from another uh, rebranded energy agency who is also now an energy and climate agency. And as I, as I mentioned, this is uh, becoming a trend. Munyanko is from uh, the Northwest Croatian Energy Agency, um, and he will take you through some, I suppose, some of the lessons learned from the remarkable project uh, in Croatia. So, Milenko, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shibus. I do hope you can hear me and see my slides. So, I would need a confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, well, um, as you said, Shimus, we're also a uh, climate agency since two years ago, and also where we are neighboring. Slovenia, so we do have some common uh, issues like also uh, Vlasta was mentioning. So I'm just going to just quickly go through uh, what we, uh, what are our lessons and what we uh, basically have come up with uh, during the course of the project. So, um, you know, uh, when talking about the importance of local decision makers, you know, they have a crucial role in addressing climate change. That is obvious and that is in both cases uh, mitigation and more and more adaptation as Vlasta was also mentioning. So. But they also do need the robust support, you know, to turn their goals actually into into the reality. And uh, to do so, what we identify is that there is basically a lot of capacity building which is needed uh, because uh, throughout their organization, so through vertical going to the all the way to the bottom to the last officials to have a have a good knowledge and understanding of what's going on. Uh, but also in developing strategic documents, which are you know, having a crucial component of climate neutrality and adaptation uh, as well. Uh, in that process, I think that is very, very, uh, very, very important to uh, see how basically to mainstream all these things into their daily processes. This is one of the, our key learnings is that 
uh, and I will show that later on is that what we want to do um, is to basically avoid creating more silos because there are silos already in the local and regional administration and we do not need uh, more of them, especially not in the field uh, that we are working in. So, uh, how basically did we start? Who were our climate leaders and how uh, and why did we uh, pick them up? So, uh, it was already mentioned today, uh, there are some uh, key uh, parameters that are, we can address to, to leaders. So, they are usually the front runners, uh, as it was mentioned by the, the, the commission representative, is it would probably be the same guy who would be, who will be coaching the local team and also, you know, uh, being ahead in uh, climate related issues in the uh, in the city or in the municipality. They are in many aspects innovators because there is a lot of innovation that is needed in the things that we are doing now, uh, because we do need now a destructive way of working in terms of uh, energy transition and climate change adaptation because we do not have time. And what else is that they have to be able to deliver the message and spread the influence within the organization, but also the outside of their organizations. And you know uh, what we see is also that they already have certain reputations. This is how we try to pick them up to be our ambassadors for the beginning. So um, just an overview, this is basically uh, where our leaders came from. Uh, majority of these red dots are basically uh, along the border with Slovenia. So we're, we, there are also a lot of similarities with that. Uh, what we did offer is uh, uh, to them is I will not go into details, but we offered the climate leadership program, which is important to bring their knowledge to our upper level because uh, we offer com a comprehensive training for them uh, for their uh, roadmap development process and you know to, for a deeper and better understanding of uh, what is needed related to mitigation and adaptation. Um, together with them in a co-creation and co-design process, we have been working on developing the climate neutrality roadmaps. And I emphasize this co-creation and co-design process with all the relevant stakeholders. And we offered them a new service, uh, and a new service which was built around the mainstreaming of mitigation into their key strategic and planning documents. So uh, our lessons learned in terms of and when talking about climate leaders uh, uh, is that climate leadership is based on trust, on trust that the process that they are engaged is and the change uh, is both possible and is needed. Um, they do have to have a necessary knowledge and understanding on the key climate related issues. They have to understand on how to basically integrate climate neutrality issues into their key processes. This is the part when I was talking about avoiding to create more silos. Uh, ability to properly communicate key messages uh, to their workers, to their uh, subordinates, but also um, horizontally, and when talking about when talking with different actors uh, in the, in their ecosystems, and what is also very important, I think, is that this process that we are all in uh, is a um, never-ending one. Uh, it's uh, because you know climate is changing, the goals are changing, or the EU EU level targets are changing, so what they have to have is the ability to rethink, reevaluate, re and redesign the entire process. So this is an iterative process that has to be, uh, you know, um, start over again, in, you know, every couple of years or even more often depends on, you know, where, where you are or what, what you're doing. Uh, in general, what we, what we have uh, uh, in terms of lessons learned, uh, what uh, the benefits of the projects are for the for the local and regional uh, governance is that, um, you know, we have increased the awareness and knowledge of the key city uh, cities official, not only in the cities that were our um, uh, our I would say target group, but also a bit uh, more wider because we had workshops with more uh, participants. So the enhanced skills and abilities of key staffs is something that we have uh, basically also um, witnessed, which is uh, also uh, due to the, um, the participation in our project. Um, the the catalyzers, the, the climate leaders, the ones that we identified, the ones we worked for uh, within the system is a crucial thing because they are the ones gathering people, they are the ones uh, riding the, and driving the process. Um, and uh, the, the, the process of the transition and connection between the key goals of climate neutrality uh, with other aspects of city functioning is getting more better and better. So we are on a good way to basically integrate what we have to do in terms of energy and climate into the key processes like uh, strategic documents, spatial planning, and then uh, in the project development as well. And uh, next, uh, basically, 
we, what we also have as a good practice is something that we are, I would say, very proud of is that we do not stop here at the local regional level. We uh, have uh, engaged into a cooperation with the, uh, with the national ministry who is in charge for energy and climate, and uh, we help them also to develop the national climate officers program. Uh, and um, that program is, you know, uh, being tested, but is going to be upscaled uh, and um, we are working also heavily with, uh, with them on this. And I think this is going to be a nice continuation of this of this project and uh, proof that I would say that uh, the, the national and the regional level can work together in create, creating a, a kind of a platform uh, that is going to help the energy transition and climate change adaptation uh, as well. So uh, this is in a nutshell uh, what we did and what are our experiences. So now I'm just getting back to Sheena's to stop presenting. Great, thank you uh, very much. Um, Milenko, for, for those insights to the Croatian experience so far and in, in the remarkable project and working with climate leaders again, some some critical points raised there in terms of uh, the first phase was about in engaging with front runners and uh, those existing leaders. I think that piece that you mentioned that they are catalyzers and being able to communicate the message is a critical piece um, and anything we can do to to help them. And uh, yeah, I think that that piece about the resilience to be able to rethink, reevaluate and redesign processes constantly can be challenging for people. The the one thing about climate action and climate change is that it's not uh, a constant straight line process. Uh, it is uh, full of change. Um, so being resilient to be able to deal with that is a is a critical piece. Um, so I suppose we're we're going to uh, open up now to a. And before I I go to the next piece, I just see. Um, a question in the chat there about the, the silo approach. So maybe just to understand that, I suppose silos are um, parallel process. So if, if we take, for example, in, in a local authority, we might have a section within the local authority dealing with roads. We might have another section dealing with uh, health. We might have another section dealing with schools. We might have another section dealing with water. Actually, they're there and they might all be doing things on climate or energy. Actually, they need to be integrated and connected because uh, the road design and the drainage design and uh, wastewater treatments and uh, drainage needs to be connected with the, the roads. People, we might also need to connect how we're designing our schools and our, our hospital systems in the context of climate action. So it's avoiding those people working in their individual components but looking at the, that bigger picture. Um, so I suppose that the silos are is a particular Irish or English term that's used when we when we talk about uh, individual action and not an integrated approach. So I hope that clarifies. Um, so to, I suppose, open it out wider to, I suppose, other regions, I'm going to um, ask for, for insights from uh, across the, the consortium in terms of uh, activities that have happened or lessons learned. So I'm going to start in France and with you, Katrin, if if that's OK. Um, that's OK. And maybe <laughs> to just introduce yourself, Katrin, and to, I uh, suppose, give insights from uh, the perspective of uh, your energy agency and the work that you've done in Remarkable and particularly in the concept of climate leadership. OK, thank you. Um, so Katrin uh, Prana, I'm working at the uh, Auvergne Rhône Alpes Energy uh, Agency, uh, so it's a regional agency working on energy environmental uh, aspects, and um, we are involved in the uh, remarkable project because we think uh, we believe that uh, this um, network is very important to get to getting all the decision makers uh, on board and to also. Um, provide uh, connecting uh, connections between uh, bottom up uh, actions and uh, top down level. So uh, um, we um, during uh, for the, the this project, we uh, we develop a network. Uh, we um, actually have two type of leaders in our network. 
uh, a few are current leaders, uh, which are, um, uh, yes, very committed uh, in this uh, topic of uh, uh, energy transition and uh, carbon neutrality. And, and the most of them are emerging leaders. And uh, we have noted that these uh, emerging leaders uh, were uh, the ones most in need of networking. And uh, they really um, want to exchange uh, to, um, to, to have um, best practices to, to to have also uh, this uh, expertise from uh, from other leaders and also from experts in uh, in our um, in our regions. So we develop peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges, and uh, uh, this uh, exchange is to the form of uh, discussions uh, during meetings. We also organize site visits and uh, and also testimonials from current leaders to emerging leaders. We focused on uh, elected representatives. Uh, these elected representatives are not the easiest target, uh, but uh, we um, I think we uh, we had uh, a success on in this challenge because one of our observer, we we also we have observers also in the project, is the National Energy uh, Transition Agency, uh, ADEMA, and um, he was uh, how this agency was involved in the project uh, from the beginning. And uh, yesterday we had um, uh, the first webinar. Uh, from these uh, initiatives launched by by this uh, energy national energy agency, it's called Elu pour agir, uh, elected to act. It's um, a new network um, focusing on elected uh, representatives, and uh, the aim is to bring together. Uh, at national level, but also at a regional level, of course, uh, 10 thousands of elected representatives by the end of the year. So it's uh, it's a big challenge, and uh, uh, we uh, we've planned to involve our regional re remarkable leaders in uh, in in this national network. Excellent. Thanks very much, Catherine. That, that's a very interesting development in France, that uh, elected to act network. Um, and uh, I think the the local elected representatives in, in your region, uh, I think should be very well prepared to enter into such a network. <laughs> and I think um, I that, that point that you raised around current and emerging leaders is, is very important. Um, in that we, I suppose, one of the key principles about Remarkable is that we need more and more leaders. So we can't re rely on uh, the smaller pool of current leaders that are out there that have been at the forefront of climate action, that we need to support and assist those emerging leaders. And exactly as you said, they they are in need of that capacity building, that networking support um, in, in greater levels. Um, so we might move over to Spain and to our colleagues in ESCAN. So um, to Margarita, if you want to give, I suppose, insights into uh, the engagements uh, in your region and uh, the lessons learned so far. OK, thank you very much. And uh, very nice to see all of you. Also, the, uh, that a lot of people, more than 90 Mm, leaders or potential leaders are here participating in this webinar and also thank you for the organizers and for again. Um, I am going just to be very briefly and to say I think two, two things. Uh, first of all, that this project started one and a half year ago and we started with this definition of leaders. I know that most of you know what we are talking about, but I'm going maybe to explain what is emerging leaders and not emerging leaders, because uh, some of you maybe you don't know what is this, the meaning of this. Uh, for us, emerging leaders are leaders with 
no or very, I would say, a small experience in climate neutrality items. And, and so these are um, how we classify our leaders, emerging leaders or, in, I would say, normal leaders. So this is uh, very important. <laughs> before I, I start to speak other things. Okay, in Spain, uh, we have been inviting leaders of several regions, not only one region. We started with, I will say, Castilla y León, but also we have uh, some leaders from Madrid region, because Madrid is not only the city, it's only the region, with about, I will, I will say, um, 10 a million inhabitants, but uh, I, and also now we are uh, inviting new leaders coming from Catalonia. And here in this webinar, we have two of these leaders here at the Observing and one or two leaders uh, that I say welcome and thank you for being here. Um, so uh, what we have done mainly, uh, we start with, a, with these invitations, we also organize several workshops and what is very important, we try to help them to, to organize um, and, and, to, yes, and to identify the main barriers for, for implementing the energy efficiency measures of the energy planning or even um, help them to just to improve these plans. Uh, we also um, work with them in these uh, climate neutrality roadmaps. So it was, I think, something parallel or complementary work of, 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 of all this assessment. How we did all these tasks, uh, mainly with bilateral meetings, workshops, exchange visits, etc. Um, and during last, I will say, 10, 10 months, we have a, nearly every two months uh, one bilateral meetings or I will say uh, online meeting with, with all of them. This is how mainly we are. And, and then only a couple of lessons learned. Semus, can I continue? Yes, please. Yeah, yes, yeah. Because, because I, I also, some of you asked me about some interesting uh, things. Um, in one common approach after all these um, tasks and activities together is that um, most of the leaders are quite interested in what others are doing about climate neutrality, how do they do it, and above all, how they accomplish it. What, what does it mean? The target of this project is that the municipality achieve the climate neutrality by 2050. So there are a lot of uh, challenges for these leaders. So they are interested to know what others are, are doing the, to, to cope with this. And also they are very interested and grateful for the activities of this project, of remarkable project that are in line with their policies and plans. Remarkable accompanies them and provides advice, information, training and planning like the roadmaps of climatic neutrality through bilateral meetings, national workshops and exchange at a local and European level. And thank you. I think this is all by now, if there are some questions. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Margarita. Again, uh... Critical, I think, from from your uh, inputs there, that um, like the a, a huge amount of the effort in Remarkable has been that connection and that working with people, uh, as we we said at the start, putting people at the centre. And I think that uh, very interesting comment that you made is that having engaged with those leaders and those emerging leaders, they want to learn more. They now have an appetite for more and about how other people are achieving climate or seeking to achieve climate neutrality and pushing towards those so i suppose that that networking grows the appetite for knowledge um lisa i might come to you in Tipperary energy agency next uh again for insights um from uh a different part of europe with different cultural and different uh local and uh, political structures and uh, insights and lessons learned so far and maybe even some of the challenges uh encountered uh, in delivering the, our ambitious project. 
Thanks, Seamus. I appreciate it and fantastic to uh, be part of this webinar, but also to, to see the, the wide range of people from across Europe that are here. Um, we were delighted in TEA to be part of this. And um, I suppose one of the interesting things for us um, that this project, I suppose, was almost in parallel with the evolution of our own climate action plan nationally in Ireland. And it's, um, I suppose, it's translation into local climate action plans. Uh, what that meant is that we actually had, um, I suppose, uh, existing leaders, but also a number of emerging leaders that that we engaged with throughout the project. And what we said to them is this project, um, uh, to quote a, a, a piece of leadership, is it allows you to be yourself, but with more skill. So it gives you the opportunity to be the authentic leader on climate um, but it helps you to build the particular skills that you need and will need in the next number of years to to engage, to influence, to motivate, but also to get things done. And um, I think that helped people to to really understand the intention behind the project from our perspective. So one of the things I think that we found particularly was as people were looking at at local climate action and their responsibilities as leaders and their responsibilities within maybe municipalities is that, you know, there, there is the need to be a leader, but also to understand and engage with very technical issues around um, energy and climate. And the climate neutrality roadmap process for us was a, it was a fantastic tool to have a safe and secure space and opportunity with your peers to, to look at the various things that you need to think about, but also to be able to say, actually, I'm not entirely sure how I understand this or I, I will need you know, support um, to understand this better. And it gave us an opportunity then to work with the, the leaders and emerging leaders in terms of site visits and you know doing more kind of I suppose supportive work to them to help them on a technical level uh, to understand some of the issues that they need to engage with. So so I think that was that was hugely valuable. I think the other side of it that we found very much was um, you know working with the leaders and emerging leaders to have the confidence to engage with their communities and to understand what their communities were feeling and thinking around uh, climate change, climate adaptation, and and to really be able to help them to have the language and to have us by their side to help them to to strengthen their ability to to listen and engage as to the needs of communities. And I suppose one of the tools that we we started to develop out of this was a communication tool and a storytelling tool to work with communities around you know potential options and outcomes for them in terms of climate and their community. And again, I suppose the whole process allowed us to have, you know, a really good collaborative engagement with our leaders and emerging leaders. And I, I go back to one of the sentences early in the webinar, I think Seamus, you said it around, you know, maybe highlighting people who were, as you say, emerging. And one of them said to me, would you call me a climate leader? Is that what I am now? And, you know, was almost shocked that that was a name that they could have even though they were doing all the things that we would recognize as climate leaders. And I think that was very powerful for them as well. And um, I would echo everybody so far in saying that the opportunity to network and, you know, meet your peers and, and also see into the European context, how others are, are actually doing very similar work and being able to learn from others. And, you know, there's a, there's a great um, uh, appetite to, to visit and engage uh, with colleagues across Europe to, to be able to see things that maybe we haven't achieved yet in Ireland and be able to see what is good practice in, in, other, um, in other regions, in other municipalities. And I think that's been also a, a real benefit of this project for our local leaders in Ireland. Um, undoubtedly, there, there are more barriers for it to come. We're in you know, strong implementation now and a lot of uh, very... Um, you know, financially challenging projects that have to happen to, to make an impact. Um, and I think we will continue to support our leaders to have that, you know, resilience, I suppose, um, to, to be able to make those decisions, but also to be there to, to guide and help them to, to understand the best options that they need to take. And, and I mean, this project has really given huge opportunity and space to be able to, to do that with our leaders. And I, I, I think it will stand to them over the next number of years what they have learned and gained through the remarkable project. 
Great, thanks very much, Lisa, for those insights. And uh, again, I suppose reflecting back, um, part of the project for for each of the local and regional authority, regional energy agencies involved was to look at developing a new a new service, the climate neutrality service. So, um, the the one that has emerged out of the TA is actually you know not a technical one. It's focused on the communication piece and. Uh, in Renko's, they were looking at that roadmap development service. So we've all developed new climate neutrality services uh, out of this project, which I think is critical. And many of them are about strategic and planning and uh, integration components, uh, as well as integrating some uh, technical aspects. I think the, the other point, just reflecting back, Lisa, on what you comment is that, I suppose, remarkable very much uh, in the local uh, uh, regional context, the partners have worked very hard to try and integrate the project with national and regional policy agendas also, that it isn't just a European initiative happening uh, in its own silo. Um, so the timing in Ireland was actually very beneficial in terms of uh, what local authorities ha had to do in the context of uh, climate action plans. Um, we might move to further north in Europe to uh, Isabella. Um, to get uh, insights and actually uh, I will tell this story. I, I know I've told it a couple of times, Isabella, in terms of the idea for this remarkable proposal came over a cup of coffee at a Manage Energy masterclass uh, when myself and Isabella started to speak about leadership. And I think on the flight home from Brussels, I wrote the one page proposal idea that was about climate leadership. Um, so uh, you can blame Isabella for you all being here that sh she raised the topic first of all. So uh, Isabella, maybe to again, share your experiences uh, from the Swedish context, but you might also mention, I suppose, what we're uh, doing in terms of the, the wider leadership circle. And um, I'll comment then also on what we've done about young uh, youth leaders, which I think uh, is important in terms of that growing leadership agenda. So over to you, Isabella. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here and so happy to be a part of this community and project that is really a, a great uh, contribution for the climate neutrality and the energy transition in Europe. So as Seamus said, uh, there were from the beginning of this project, uh, at the heart of everything was this leadership and the need of the local leadership to make the energy transition happen on the local level. And uh, to be able to really be that strong leader, one crucial uh, thing is to have the courage. You need to be having a courage to be that leader, to make those decisions that is so important for us to happen right now. In this time period, in this era, exactly where we are now, we need these decisions to come in place quick so that we can do what is needed to make the energy transition and the journey towards climate neutrality to actually happen on local level. So in our case, in the North Sweden, we were also emphasizing on emerging leaders and uh, especially office, official elected uh, people what, where we wanted to build in this leadership and we wanted to support them in, have, in becoming strong in the climate leadership. So to do this, we saw that to build up this courage and, and to have this strength as a leader, we saw important things like having support from people who can provide the leaders with uh, uh, the right data, uh, like being informed about uh, different kind of data for, for energy uh, usage and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and these things that maybe for engineers is very uh, usual to know, but uh, for a leader, maybe it is not very uh, sure that they know how to get this information. So by providing them with this data, we were building a strength in them to uh, be stronger when they were going to uh, implement the actions that is required. When you need to convince a lot of other people why the money is going to put into this action and not something else that is big, building health or welfare, you need to be having the good data to really make justification why the money should go into this direction. So we were also supporting them how to implement the 2050 targets for climate neutrality. And in Sweden, we have targets for 2045 to become climate neutral. So this we did uh, by helping them to develop the roadmap for climate neutrality. 
And uh, here in these discussions, we also started to talk about the, the, le uh, the rest 15% uh, that need to be compensated. So we have started a discussion about how to plan to compensate for those 15% and some municipalities have started to do investigations about how that can happen and how that can take place. And here also the identification of what part of the greenhouse gas emission that is not able to remove is being visible, like if there is a big road, for example, or anything similar like that. So we also emphasized a lot about how to create the local engagement and how to bring in the stakeholders. And this was one of the strengths with the roadmap because the uh, decision maker often only can reach the greenhouse gas emission in their own organization, but how to reach in the whole territory, how to get all the emissions arrayed. So here the roadmap was a really good tool to work with, engage the stakeholders uh, that could address the whole territory. And uh, from our office, we have developed some new services, as, men as Seamus mentioned. And uh, one of them was actually how to create the engagement in the whole municipality. So we are looking at compromise, uh, comprehending the four-day climate leader program into a one-day training that is going to be uh, implemented in the whole uh, municipalities. Uh, in some of the participants in the remarkable project. And when I say the whole municipality, it means all the municipality staff, all the uh, politicians, including also the opposition. So it will be like a light version of the climate leadership program. So I think that is uh, the summary of our work done so far. Great, thanks, Isabella. And I, I like those words, courage and strength. Um, and, but for the, for them to have that courage and strength, they need trust in and uh, robust information. So that's where the role of local and regional energy agencies becomes very strong, and that they can provide that data, the analysis, the the technical background to support the leaders. Um, and I think that that service around stakeholder management engagement processes is is a is a key one uh, to bring. If we come back to Tigs. Uh, component about bringing people, designing the system for the people. Um, do you want to just mention in terms of the, the wider climate leadership circle and the, the LinkedIn profile, Isabella, that we're working on at the moment? Yes, thanks. So uh, one part of the project is to build a community in Europe for climate leaders. So we have chosen the platform as LinkedIn. So we have during the project created a LinkedIn group called Climate Leader Circle. And this is an open group where people who are wanting to be more uh, engaged in this topic is welcome to join. I'm going to share my screen with the QR code. So if anybody here, for example, in this meeting feel that you are up for joining the group, or our community, you are so welcome to come. If you also have some friends in mind, you know our climate leaders, but maybe couldn't make it today, you are so welcome to also invite them to this community. We want to create this as a, a group that people can share and uh, continue to build the climate leadership in Europe. So you can access the, the LinkedIn group by uh, this QR code. And during this spring, we are having Another six webinars during this spring that we have called as lunch hangouts. It's a 45 minute session where you can bring your sandwich. You can just come and join us into uh, the webinar and listen to inspiring talks from different climate leaders around in Europe with a purpose to support and inspire and build the climate leadership and yeah, actually support all of us for this important task that is ahead of us. Great, thanks very much, Isabella. And absolutely, we do encourage. And I, I noticed some people looking for um, contact lists to be shared. Uh, I, I'll have to double check with Diana, but I don't think we are able to to share that due to GDPR. But uh, if people join the LinkedIn group, you'll be able to connect with people. Um, I might just uh, before we we finish up, uh, maybe. There was a question in the chat, and I might uh, ask maybe Milenko or Vlast if you want to comment in terms of uh, somebody mentioned that the Covenant of Mayors initiative um, and uh, alignments or um, sim 
kind of connections with with that. I don't know, if you want to make a comment on that. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, a lot of our leaders actually came from the cities that were signatories also to the Covenant of Mayors initiatives and who have undergone the process of uh, developing SEPs and SECOPs recently. Um, we also had a case in Croatia, for example, that um, uh, the minister would like to kind of make uh, SECOPs or the roadmaps that we have been uh, working on to this project as um, ex ante conditionality type of documents for uh, different calls they're uh, uh, they're publishing in Croatia. So this is our connection towards the towards the, the Covenant of Mayors, and you know uh, obviously we have been using a lot of data that has been priorly developed through the SECAPs or CAPs or baselines and stuff like that. So there is a clear connection, or, uh, or I would say clear clear path towards uh, what the COM is doing in both in terms of mitigation and adaptation recently. So yes, I think it's uh, it has been helpful for, uh, for a lot of us because it has given some structure. It has given also some uh, some support tools, especially when talking about adaptation, because they are also developing this adapt tool. So for uh, climate change risk uh, uh, and uh, vulnerabilities assessment. So my answer would be yes, it was helpful. And I think it will be helpful as well in the, for the future. And I think that more more connections need to be drawn anyway, because we do not need separate and more and more documents, but rather ones that are kind of merged and integrated into everyday uh, work of the uh, local and regional governance. Yeah, thanks very much, Milenko. And I suppose the, absolutely we tried to build on the, that capacity that had happened around the, the CCAPs and the uh, but it was we were, we did have that vision around climate neutrality and looking even a little bit beyond where some of the common of mayor's discussion. So so challenging the participants to to consider that. Um, Vlasa, are there any final points from your side from the Slovenia perspective you wanted to add in addition to what you spoke earlier? I'll take that silence as a no. Um, so I suppose just from some closing remarks from from my side, um, the, I suppose that the concept of the the climate leaders and remarkable climate leaders project really did start with a seed, and um, but has grown to I suppose hopefully a, a reasonably mature tree at this stage, um, like the. The, the roots of the of the tree are, are grounded in the what Dumman spoke to us about about leadership and ethnography and understanding people and how people uh, consider and develop um, as leaders and how they operate in their environments. Um, and I suppose that the learning for the partnership was uh, being in their environments and understanding how decisions are made or perhaps not made. Uh, the challenges that people face in moving climate agenda forward and then also uh, finding those emerging leaders that uh, perhaps spoke a little bit less at the start of the meetings but then grew and became uh, recognized as as leaders it was the, the the trunk of the tree then became uh, the climate leadership program which is an upskilling and a support program for those leaders uh, then we added to that the uh, climate neutrality roadmaps which are referred to, and these are, you know, guidance documents that uh, enable the municipalities, the local authorities, to consider what does climate neutrality look like in 2050, or in in the case of Sweden in 2045, and uh, to to challenge them to look that far and perhaps think back to what uh, work back from that date about what has to be achieved, what are the building blocks of of those. And then the, I suppose the, the the branches that have emerged out of, of that tree are these climate neutrality services that uh, the local and regional and, and climate agencies have developed and are developing and are providing in the regions, whether they're dealing with integration of uh, climate mitigation adaptation in roadmap development, whether it's around communication, whether it's around engagement, um, those critical components. And uh, the the buds that are on the tree um, I refer to are our youth leaders, our young leaders. We had an amazing event held in Austria last summer, 
where we gathered 50 young leaders from across the world, actually, not just from across Europe, where they spent a week looking at a, a clean energy challenge. So they were challenged to look at, uh, they arrived in a, a beautiful part of Austria in the mountains, but they were uh, cloistered in a building where we, we challenged them to work on particular energy and climate projects. Everything from developing biomethane to designing uh, a new building um, for the Regea's new offices to uh, energy communities. Lots of interesting uh, challenges and people from young people from across the world uh, took on these challenges and worked in groups and presented back their solutions over a, uh, working on it over a week. I suppose from us uh, as coaches in that session, it was inspiring to see that those young people uh, are now the driving and the future and their engagement. So critically, we, we need to build those, those new leaders uh, from young leaders right through to the uh, supporting the emerging leaders so that the uh, that that global that green tribe uh, to finish on Doman's words uh, grows that we can deliver on the climate neutrality ambitions. Um, so I do encourage and invite you to uh, join the climate leader circle and we've used the concept of circle as as inclusive as possible. Um, so please do engage with the LinkedIn profile. Um, so Diana has shared and Isabella have shared it on the on the chat. Please do connect to the website climateleaders.eu or connect with uh, us via email. And uh, as Isabella mentioned, uh, if you follow us on social media uh, using uh, the various hashtags or connect on the website, you'll see the details of uh, our lunchtime sessions also where you get to hear from actual uh, leaders that have connected into the project to to speak about their experiences and their uh, evolution over the life of the project and what climate leadership means for them. So with that, I'd just like to very much thank uh, all of our speakers uh, for giving their time today. I know Taig from DGNR has had to leave, but to Vlasta, Milenko, Isabella, Katrin, Margarita, uh, Lisa, thank you very much for your time. And in the background, uh, Diana has done all of the, the hard work. Uh, I just have to show up at these things. Um, everything else is, is done in the background and I show up when I can connect in. Um, and my colleague Gloria, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have an enjoyable uh, rest of the day. Take care. Thank you, Seamus. Before we uh, finish the webinar, we have a very nice announcement for all of you. We are starting today the second season of our podcast. So if you want to know more and learn more from our leaders, uh, please uh, do listen to our podcast. Uh, the episodes are around 10 minutes, so it's a very brief, uh, to the point, interesting topic. Uh, I share the link in the in the chat, so please you can find us on Spotify uh, and uh, listen to what our remarkable climate leaders uh, have to say about uh, their initiatives. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Diana, and uh, take care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you so much to everybody. It was a really great joy to be here today. Thank you.